So some of our objectives today uh, that I'd like to talk about is going to be the history, a uh, little bit of dyas, some care tips as we're into the late summer and early fall, pest and disease issues, digging and dividing some of the tubers as we're going into the fall and you're wanting to store them for uh, this winter, and some harvest tips, um, just some tricks that you might have as you continue the, bl the blooming season right now. So dahlias um, are part of the Asteraceae family, which is the sunflower family. Uh, dahlias are native to the mountainous regions of Mexico. It's actually the national flower. Hernando Cortez found them to be a long established favorite in the gardens of the Aztecs when he invaded Mexico in 1519 to establish a colony of New Spain. Along with that, in about the 1800s, they were actually named uh, Dahlia, and it was given to them in honor of Anders Dahl, a famous Swedish botanist. And as the seeds made their way from Mexico and reached Spain, um, it wasn't until the 1800s that we actually started seeing a lot of the breeding going on in Europe. And that's when we really seen the colors and the trends kind of exploding from there. So the American Dahlia Society recognizes 15 official colors. The only ones that are not accepted are green, brown, and a true blue. So if you see a blue dahlia, it's probably been either floral sprayed or it's been dyed. So we they don't actually accept any of the color of a true blue. So that's kind of a, a tidbit for you if you ever see one. Um, you know that they've kind of been colors changed out somehow. They also have 18 flower forms that they recognize. Some of the ones that we grow um, traditionally are the ball, uh, cactus, stellar, water lily, as you see here, peony, anemone, an and some orchids are some of the favorite, but there's 18 flower forms that are recognized. Summer and fall care tips. Kind of going into that, um, you know, the first thing we want to look at always when you're doing is you want to make sure that you had a soil test. And if you haven't gotten a soil test this year, um, fall is a great time. You can still get a soil test. Um, you can go ahead and take a sample before you go into the spring growing season of next year. Um, you definitely need to look at that soil test before you apply any of the fertilizer. Um, and a good time is actually to apply fertilizer whenever that plant starts to bud, right? Um, a reminder that the three numbers when we're looking at any fertilizer represent the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium. Those numbers are associated with the percent content of each of the nutrients listed. What we really want to do is with dahlias, phosphate encourages tuber growth and encourages larger blooms. So we want to have a good fertilizer practice to apply about five to six pounds of a low nitrogen fertilizer when they're first growing per 100 square foot, and then a handful and really a hand apply, apply it or put it around each of your, your tubers um, throughout the growing season. And then you can kind of mix that and you can increase that phosphorus level. So if you're going to like a 0 20 20, um, or you might even have like a six. Uh, 5810, but you want to have that higher middle number that's going to be increased. Another way that you can do it and have a consistent application might be to apply liquid fertilizer with a high phosphate um, every two weeks um, throughout the blooming season. Remember though, nitrogen is going to go and produce those foliage, and so you only want to start to apply a high nitrogen number when you see that those buds starting to bud. Summer um, is a great time when you start seeing your young plants. Uh, this is a, a beginning of the season. You're gonna see they have three to four pairs of leaves. We wanna start watching them because you're gonna have a rapid growth, right? They're gonna have a big growth spurt. So what you're gonna do is you can see I have a blue arrow. It's gonna show where we wanna pinch out the tops of those buds. And I know it sounds like you're, you're counterintuitive, right? We don't wanna do that. But to have those long laterals to use to have nice stems, we're gonna to wanna to pinch out that top first bud. 
This is considered um, pinching. You can get it, you'll see it with the blue one right here. You can see it's gonna leave a little bit of a scab, but it's not gonna hurt anything. It's gonna go ahead and heal itself and we're not gonna have any issues with that. But we're also wanna think about, we need to disbud. So if we're not going to pinch that main stem, we need to disbud each of the side axillary um, stems. And that way we can have a larger bloom and a better quality of stem. And pinching at the, at the end of the growing branch is the best way to do it um, using some shears. If you try to break them, you're gonna see that you're gonna have tearing of the stem. Um, but it's a great time to start monitoring and, and preparing those um, axillary buds. Um, one way to promote additional uh, blooming, if you're having trouble with this, and, and pinching is always the hardest part for everybody, um, is that you can deadhead um, you know, and, and do that too. But I really like to go ahead and, and do nice clean cuts and clean um, stems and remove those spent blooms. Why we wanna do this is because it promotes a strong stem, right? We want larger blooms, we want a strong stem. As you can see um, by, as they go, as your dahlia starts to bloom out, you're gonna see that you're gonna want it to have a full bloom before you harvest, right? If we pick them in these little small bud stages, that's how it's gonna stay. And if you need to use it, that's one thing, but when we're wanting it to be full maximum bloom and a full uh, growth of that and having all those petals out, we wanna have a nice strong sturdy stem. And this is why we need to do these little pinching tips and cutting off to, to so they support that, that big robust head. One way we also can support it um, is what we need to do in our early spring and, and summer and into fall as they're growing quite vigorously um, is staking. And that's some job, I think if anyone's gonna grow dahlias, you're gonna learn, oh, I hate dahlias because they take all this extra work, but oh, the, the blooms are glorious, right? But we do need to think about how we're gonna stake. Uh, dinner plate dahlias are, are a larger bloom um, and they need to be staked. And you need to think about how you're gonna do it. If it's gonna be by a bamboo pole, if you're gonna use tomato cages, if you just have a few, um, if you're going to have a large amount of them, um, having metal rods so that you have strong supports and stringing weaving between each of those growing supports will help promote those long straight blooms. What happens is if you have them condensed in smaller spaces, uh, this is in our high tunnel. Um, it's an example of the metal stakes and then you can go down, I've seen where they go in a border just straight down and do along and kind of like a corral and just to pull them in. I find that they tend to lean a little bit. So what I like to use as an example right here of a twine string and then weaving those supports in and out. And that keeps those branches upright. It keeps the stems um, nice and straight. And then those multiple blooms can be harvested. And even with the weaving, you can see there's plenty of space to reach in and still be able to harvest. Why we like it um, is just because look at those straight blooms as you're going, it fills in and you wanna be able to harvest uh, readily throughout the season. And if you don't, you're gonna have everything flopped over and then you're gonna have bent stems and those are just not as pretty to harvest. The next thing we always have to contend with if we're dealing with our dahlias um, is definitely insect damage. Um, <laughs> things that you seem to love, um, as much as we do the blooms are insects. And, and you can see from the pictures here, um, dahlias can be damaged by insect pests that chew on the petals. Uh, grasshoppers like to chew on the leaves. Uh, Japanese beetles sometimes will come in um, throughout the seasons. Um, Biggest thing that I have right now, uh, this type of year is cucumber beetles or the corn rootworm beetles and thrips. Um, you'll see those coming in. I have a picture of a spider in there, um, which probably could be considered a, a friend. Um, but you know, as you're bringing in those pests, you're also gonna have aphids that'll come in here. Aphids will leave, um, in the beginning of the season, will have curling of the leaves and leave a sticky film on the leaves. Slugs can damage uh, early, believe it or not, early transplants and get in there. Spider mites uh, will actually, this time of year, you're going to start seeing a transition and you might see uh, their, their webbing before you actually see the spider mites. You'll find that fine webbing will be along everything. 
and those, you know, everything is kind of going towards those really to, to be having all the other pests that might be involved with the, your blooms. But you can remember um, one great way is some people can tolerate damage better than others, right? If it's just one little hole, is it really going to mean that you need to spray a lot of insecticides? Um, if it's just a few petal damage um, items, maybe not. If you're seeing a total infestation, then um, you might need to think about using an insecticide or possibly using, um, if you're starting out and you wanna use a biological control, a great one would be ladybugs, uh, green lace wings. Items such as that can be put into um, your setting and they might be a biological control that helps out. One other way that we really like to use, especially for our chewing insects, um, is using a, a physical method is to put these netting, these mesh bag organza and mesh bags over the top of our blooms. Um, it takes a little more time and um, there's different size bags that you can purchase if you're gonna have just the balls. Um, we tend not to have as much chewing damage as you will some of the larger ones, but you can see from the bouquets that we like to do, uh, this is a wedding of bouquet, and that cream uh, and light colored uh, cafe lattes, they definitely will go ahead and damage those first. <laughs> Every time it seems like they will go to the yellows, the whites, and you'll have those damaged before some of your burgundy and your darker colors. So if you use this control method, it, it definitely can save some of your blooms, um, especially if you're gonna use it as a focal point. Diseases that uh, control and need controlled uh, definitely will come into a factor, especially here in Southern Illinois, we're in growing zone six. And what we see is right now going into this high humidity um, is we're gonna see some powdery mildew issues. Um, powdery mildew definitely uh, will cause havoc to not only some of your other you know, herbaceous crops like your zinnias and uh, some of your cosmos, they definitely will hit your dahlias. And you can see uh, the powdery mildew is a fungal issue. It causes the leaves to have a whitish gray appearance. Um, you can see here, we're starting to see a little bit of powdery mildew. It's going to cause it to be distorted just a little bit. Uh, the leaves will wilt and then they'll drop. And one thing that you want to think about is um, the quality of your blooms and your plants. If you really want this as, um, if it's a hobby and you only have a couple plants, it may not be um, burdensome to you, you know, to, to do it late in the season. But if you're wanting this as a crop or to be a showcase piece for the fall, um, you could use a fungal spray and use it as a preventative um, to start on a spray regimen. And if you start a spray regimen, you really should start it um, in mid-June and then start every two weeks um, to 10 days to 14 days, depending on your, your label um, directions. You definitely want to read the label, but typically you're going to want to get on a spray regimen that you kind of go throughout the season. You want to do this all the way to the end of September. So dias definitely can cause a little more headache if you're if you're needing to do that. But if you have a large crop and you want to to keep them going and and to save the tubers, then you definitely want to think about management practices on them. Another disease that um, is definitely going to be an issue uh, when we're looking at tubers, uh, possibly especially when the seasons like this season has had a wet summer, um, you're going to see some crown gall issues. And um, these photos are not of mine. I actually have photo credit from Dr. Hammett. Um, he's a pathologist in New Zealand, and he's wrote a couple books. One of his uh, books is The World of Dahlias, and uh, he's a plant pathologist. And what he actually attributes the crown gall symptoms um, is agrobactum tumulusifician. Uh, rhodobacter. <laughs> I spit out their scientific name, um, but this scientific name is Aerobacter. And what we want to think about is this organ organism um, usually causes these um, protrusions and um, many of the tubers um, to have extra leafy, uh, leafy and uh, cauliflower looking distinct 
uh, pro tissue profusions that come out. And what happens is um, it's going to cause this, this issue and it's going to have extra leaflets. So you're going to see a lot of new growth kind of coming out of this organism um, and around these tubers. The problem with that is, is now that that um, rotobacterium has gotten into there, what it's going to do is it's going to continue to go throughout the tuber and it's going to cause issues. And so this is something that you will not want to keep. You're going to want to go ahead and um, actually destroy this one. I know it, it's hard to tell people that, but you definitely want to go ahead and destroy any tubers that you see. As you can kind of see on the on the pictures, how it looks almost like that cauliflower heads. It has some um, extra leafy growth coming out. All of those should be go ahead and taken away and, and destroyed, not and put into your compost pile. Um, that's not recommended, but to go ahead and destroy those tubers so that that isn't transmitted in the soil or into any of your other crops. Um, you'll see that that can kind of affect other um, perennials and other of uh, your uh, flowers that might be around it if you continue to, to harvest and you those, use those blooms. So um, it definitely is reported um, Dr. Hammett is a, a leading uh, pathologist, and he definitely would tell you that you need to go ahead and get rid of those and start new um, fresh tubers. So now that I've given you all the bad news of, of all the things that could happen to your, your tubers, we want to talk about some digging and dividing of the tubers. Um, you can see they're glorious. You plant one tuber um, in the spring and look how you have one plant that grows and it can give you a multitude of um, additional tubers. So you can, you can buy that one $10 tuber that everybody thinks is a, a little really expensive and you probably shouldn't be buying and it'll look, multiply and you can add more to your, your inventory and into your garden. I love them for that reason. Uh, definitely, you want to think about when we start going, right, we're going to have some, uh, some best tips. And the first thing I want to tell you is that you need to think about when you're going to, to harvest your, your tubers or, or to go ahead and dig them up. We want to have our supplies and our tools ready, right? So when we get our tools ready, we want to have a clean shovel. Um, we're going to have, want to have a rack. Um, like a bread rack or possibly a tote that is clean and sanitized. And we want to have some hand pruners or shears or possibly a knife that you're going to use um, that has been sterilized. Okay. And as I mean um, sterilized or sanitized, what I'm really talking about is I want you to sanitize your tools um, between each of these clumps. Because if we would have an issue with that crown gall or another uh, pathogen or something, this is just gonna clean everything up. And we're not gonna spread anything from our possibly infected tubers into our new clean stock. So we wanna use a 10% bleach solution, and one, which means one part bleach and nine parts water. And we're gonna wanna just set our tools, put it into a, a container, and, and dip your tools into it, clean them up, let them dry, set them on the rack. That's why we like to have a workbench that kind of has holes in it. We let it clean and, and, and dry off and just set there. As you can see, this is some clumps, right? So we're gonna take these clumps um, that we've dug up. So we might've used um, a pitchfork, we might've used a potato fork, we might've used a shovel, depending on where we're at, or we might gently have pulled them out of our ground. Um, depending on how they've been, you know, put in there and they've been placed in the rows. But what you want to think about is that you're going to want to knock off any excess dirt, um, but we want to keep them. As you can kind of see, we want to make sure that we've cut them, but so that we have a little bit of dirt off of them, but it's okay if there's some um, soil that is still in there um, around the region. It's not going to hurt anything as we're first starting out. So, when we're starting this out, we want to think about what time of year, if we're taking and we're going to take that shovel or that potato fork and pull them up. Um, you can kind of see this is getting late fall into the season. This is inside a, a tunnel that we have. And you can kind of see they're starting to get a little bit of powdery mildew. Um, you can see the white, whitish on their leaves. Um, it's cool weather. It's starting to, the blooms are going to start slowing down. And this is a time that I'm going to start thinking about. I really want to go ahead and dig these up uh, and get ready for that. And we really typically wait until close to our first frost of the season. Um, we want to 
want to get those harvested, you know, it might come in and, and you're going to know if it the first frost has actually hit your plant because you're going to come out and they're going to be kind of green. They might have a little bit of powdery mildew started on them, which isn't hurting them, but it's still on there. And then you have a frost event. And once that frost event hits that next day by noon, you're going to know it because they're going to be wilted, they're going to be turning brown, black, and almost immediately. Uh, dahlias do not take a frost event very well. <laughs> they're going to, they're going to, you're going to come in and it's going to, you're going to notice that it's going to like be, oh wow, they got frosted last night. Um, they're going to be dropped down. So we want to hit that right at that prime time. It can be that first frost event or right before, if you know it's going to happen that evening. Uh, we want to dig those tubers up. And then we want to cut back all this top uh, biomass plant material and leave only about four inches of the stock. The, the true thing that you want to think about is don't let it die all the way back into the stock region, into that crown region. Um, we don't want all of that to be completely dead. We want to harvest prior to that. So if you wait like two or three frosts into it and you decide, oh, I'm going to go out there now and harvest, it's going to be a little bit late because you're going to see some die back into that crown region. And we really want to preserve that crown. So um, when we're thinking about that, we want to think, well, I'm looking at my plants. I know I had a little bit of powdery mildew, but I didn't really see anything else. Um, is there a virus, maybe a problem that can often be misleading? Um, we're not sure of the symptoms alone, right? So if you think you might have an issue with your, your plants or you notice some things um, like your plants were showing some modeling that you really hadn't seen before, that might be a thing that you wanna get tested before you save those tubers, right? So we wanna think about that. If, do we have, did we have a lot of ring spots? As you're starting to pull back that, that plant material, is this normal plant material or am I seeing things that might be, um, you know, something else that's wrong with my plant? That might be a time that you really think about, did I use any insecticides? Did I use anything that I shouldn't have used? Because viruses really can't be controlled um, with removing anything um, with a pesticide or spraying a fungicide they're still gonna be there. You're gonna see them as you're removing that debris. And that's usually the, the time when you really are inspecting those plants to think about, do I need to keep these tubers or were this plant possibly infected with something, a virus, or um, they had some ring spots I really didn't recognize earlier in the season, but now that I'm looking at it a little closely, I, I see it. Um, I would not put those infected plant material into your compost bin. The recommendation would be to go ahead and try to discard it and burn it or, or place it outside of a compost bin. And if it gets really down to it um, and you're noticing something and you go, wow, should I really keep these tubers or, or put these to the side? Um, you may want to take a sample and send it to the uh, Illinois, University of Illinois Plant Clinic and have them test the plant material before you keep those tubers. If you see something that's really striking or uh, showing that maybe there's something wrong with my plants. But as we get those that biomass off, that's usually the time after we've inspected it that we now have a nice pile of tubers. And I definitely would say um, this is probably not the best practice <laughs> as I'm taking pictures of it. But what we like to do, uh, we have a rack, we have a table that has holes in it. We probably should have labeled each of the plants. Uh, we labeled them because we had big groupings of certain colors, and this has been laid on the table by color uh, blocks. So for our method, it'd be nice if you're doing it at home and you don't have as many tubers, you might want to take and label with a at least a, a piece of paper, um, label each of your your clumps so that way then you know exactly what color you have. Um, just kind of best practice method on that. The other thing that you're going to think about is, um, as you can see, we're, we're removing any excess soil. There's going to still be a little bit because you're, you're pulling that clump up and that's okay. But what we want to do is we want to lay them out and let them cure. So they're like your sweet potatoes or your, um, you know, regular um, 
potatoes that you're going to pull up, you're going to want to let them cure a little bit, right? Because they're in that tuber family. We're wanting those skins to get a little bit, um, you know, harder. We're wanting that cuticle to kind of harden so that we can store it and write on it. So you're going to want this, let them set out. The only thing is, is you do not want them to freeze because what's going to happen is if they got a freeze event and you pulled it up and it was nice and it's 70 degrees outside and you go, oh, I'm going to let them cure. And then it dropped down into the late, in the low thirties and you had a freeze, they will freeze and they'll just turn to mush. And it's all that work that you did will be lost. So think about that. Think about, um, you know, what, whether you have, what options do you have, uh, but you do want them to cure. The next thing, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about taking and, div and dividing them. So sometimes that's the worst part of the, of the whole trick, right, is to grab your clump. You have, you know what color it is, you know the name of it, but what we want to do is we want to have our clean um, utensil is at this point we use some hand shears. Um, we take it in and we try not to break the necks or damage the crown, right? So as you flip it over, you're going to see the crown is going to come down from the stem. And each of these are going to have little necks on them, right? They're all connecting inside to that stem. And it's really hard to see when they're big clumps. So this is the hardest part. It, I, you always get scared because you're like, I don't want to do this. I'm going to break them all. <laughs> And sometimes it happens. It's not a big deal. It, it does happen occasionally. So don't, don't fear. Um, it's still something you want to try. Um, so here, I'm going to kind of give you a run through. This is a giant clump. Um, you can see as you're dividing that down the crown, you're wanting to keep a piece of that crown with their neck. So you can see this blue arrow is kind of showing. You can see it has a piece of the crown and you have this long neck that's on there, but you're wanting a piece of that crown kept on the end, like almost the tip of that neck. That's where your growing eyes are gonna come out of uh, for next season. You're wanting them to be divided um, and pulled apart, but you're not wanting to lose any of those uh, segments if you can. Now you're gonna have a few of them fall off and, and pull apart. This is a very large clump. So um, you're gonna see that happens, but you definitely wanna try to keep as many of them as you can. So here's a picture it's gonna show you of this clump. Um, you're gonna see there's soil in there. They're pulled apart. The arrow's gonna show, you're gonna have little pieces that just break off um, just because they didn't have a, a long neck. They had pieces, they were, they were building those tubers and you have them, but they're not gonna be viable for next year. So those are just gonna be, have to be discarded. Um, it, it's part of it, don't fear, <laughs> you know, uh, and the first and beginning, I was like trying to keep them to see if they might be viable. Typically, if they don't have a neck on them, I will tell you they probably are not going to be viable. You can try to keep it if you want, but I'm going to recommend that you go ahead and discard it and um, really focus on the good long necks. So if you look at the ones that have a heart next to them, those are ones that are going to be um, that we love. They have long necks. They have a crown piece to them. And they're actually going to give us some viable tubers that we're going to be able to keep and, and have for the next season. At this point, um, I divided them when I dug it to show you guys this. I have seen two different approaches um, as they do it. Some want to wait until and store it as a clump and divide it in the spring to see what to kind of what comes out of their, their harvesting. I have found that I have a better success with dividing mine um, in the fall and storing them. And then if I don't have a viable uh, tuber in the spring to discard it at that time. Um, there's just different methods. It's, it's whatever works for you. Uh, what works for me is to go ahead and divide it up just because of space and, and that's a limiting factor as you can see. Um, one dahlia can produce multiple tubers if we're lucky, right? So we definitely want to um, store them, you know, most efficiently and and maximize those those blooms for next year. So um, one way that we personally I have done it is I like to take a layer of uh, take a cardboard box and get a layer of wood chips, put that on the bottom of the box, put a layer of vermiculite. And then each of those tubers, and I'm gonna just flip back one, 
as you can see, these necks along through here underneath the arrow by the heart, those would be either written on with a Sharpie, the name of them, of uh, the variety, or at least a piece of paper on each of that layer, um, some identifying characteristic. You can write on each of those tubers after they have cured with a black Sharpie. They will go ahead and produce eyes and grow. That's not going to affect any of their viability. Um, they'll still continue on. Um, most uh, tubers will be written on if they're from local farms and they'll have the name of them on it, uh, written on them with a Sharpie and that's fine. Um, we will do that. Um, if we're doing a whole layer, we'll write on a couple of them and put them on the layer. So we put down our, we have a cardboard box. We have a layer of wood chips. We have a layer of vermiculite. We have a layer of our tubers. Again, a layer of vermiculite over the top and the layer of wood chips. So basically we're making a sandwich of having the vermiculite and the uh, wood chips. What that's gonna do is it's gonna pull out any extra um, moisture that we have in the tubers, any um, you know events that might be sweating or anything that we have a, a warm spell, it would be pulling away any of that excess moisture away from those tubers to make them viable. We'll layer it and we'll continue up the box. Um, we'll then put that box with the name on it or however it just depend on how many we can put in there, <laughs> as big as the box is. You want it where you can handle it. It's not going to break out the bottom, right? We want to be able to handle our box, um, have it labeled correctly. I'll flip the lids over the top and then we'll place it in the basement with a dehumidifier. You can take your dahlias and put them into a piece of saran wrap and then you can layer them um, in saran wrap. <clears throat> I have seen that happen. Um, and then you also want to make sure that you have labels on them so you know exactly what the tuber is <laughs> come spring. I've also heard of people taking, if they don't want to do the wood chip method, they've taken old blankets or straw and kind of layered it um, that way with either straw or blankets. Um, another way I've heard, um, if you're in um, growing zone seven or below, I have heard that they have taken, put it into a, a more of a heated greenhouse, put it into some soil and then kind of put a layer of soil and encased it kind of in a layer of soil um, and kept them like an underneath um, a growing bench. Um, I typically don't find that to be successful because we typically have weather that drops down below that 10 degrees um, and that will cause damage to the tubers. <clears throat> so I don't like to chance that, but if you're, you want to gamble and that's something that you think you might want to try, um, it is definitely an option that I've heard of other individuals doing. Um, I just don't personally like to do that. All right. Um, one other thing that we want to think about when we look at these at our blooms is <laughs> look how gorgeous they are, right? Um, this is a cafe latte. Um, we want we know that it's going to be a little extra trouble, but look at the blooms. Um, you can even use the buds on those. Um, we use them for cut flowers, um, for arrangements throughout the season. We'll use them for wedding bouquets. Um, we'll have these as some stunning showstopper blooms. Why we like to use these is because they do not, they're very fragile and they do not like to transport very well. So florists typically want to work with local growers to receive dahlias because if unless even wrapped they're so fragile um and they cost um three to four dollars a stem in some locations um just to get them and then shipping them and their half of them are broken they're definitely not a great um uh, flower if you're going to use them unless you can grow them locally and that's really why we love dahlias and we love to be a, a have a farm with dahlias um so if you're going to use these, we want to kind of give you some tips um, before I end here the session and take some questions on how you can use them as a cut flower. So one of the main tips if you're going to use a dahlia is to cut in the early morning or late afternoon. Um, we want them to be uh, fully hydrated. We want them to have uh, those carbohydrates kind of stored up and we want to cut them um, at peak. Uh, another thing is that 
what you can do is you can place your flowers in some warm water immediately after cutting them, right? So dahlias respond well um, to some warm water treatment. Uh, the other thing is, is that when you cut flowers, you only want to cut them, you know, at, at that maturity, because if you're going to cut a lot of the, bu uh, the buds and you think, oh, they'll open up, they're not going to open. <laughs> I'll let you know. You, you want to make sure they're mature size, they're where you want them to be when you cut them, because that's really where they're going to stay. On these um, right here, these are peaches and cream uh, dahlias. These are considered the ball type dahlia on the left-hand side. Um, stems that are harvested, um, you can harvest them different ways. You can have shorter stems to them, you can cut them off, or you can have really long stems. It's however you wanna do it. Um, they have two different methods. Uh, we use warm water. You can harvest them. I've heard if you're having trouble with the larger uh, dinner plate dahlias and they tend to wilt up really quickly on you, one thing that you can do is you can place them in very hot water, um, about 160 to 180 degrees, um, put them in that, and then allow that to cool down uh, just gradually um, for at least an hour and just let it naturally cool down to room temperature. Um, what that will do, will it will stimulate um, the water uptake of that stem and it'll go ahead and hydrate everything and hydrate your blooms. And I'll give you a long, a longer four to six day base life. Um, but this treatment is hard for some people to do just because they hate to do that really hot water and they're worried they're going to, to damage the stems or damage the blooms. Um, what you can do, another method um, is using that, that warmer water. Um, you can take and cut the dahlias, uh, dip them immediately into some cold water and then put them in that warmer water. Um, and then you, Go ahead and strip off the leaves and let everything hydrate um, and fill the buckets and then fill it to a really high level and, and just barely let this uh, bloom stick out over the, the bucket and have it fully uh, immersed in water. And that will seem to help um, keep everything hydrated and um, set those blooms for maximum base life. Another way that we want to use our blooms, um, if we're going to use them in a cut flower industry, we'll use them for wedding work. Um, it may be for uh, events to do like maybe an arbor piece or at a wedding cake. By doing that, what we want to do is we want to put them into some water tubes. Um, you want to keep everything hydrated and those petals hydrated. Um, they'll have a really nice base life. They typically won't crash uh, too bad, but you can put them into some water tubes um, and set them underneath the greenery. So if you're if you're doing that, you want to think about um, the mechanics behind what you're going to do. Um, again, uh, these are some peaches and cream. Um, we want everyone to enjoy because they're a little more labor intensive. Um, you should enjoy your your blooms, you should enjoy having um, dahlias around so that you can do beautiful um, garden work. Even if you're just cutting some blooms and harvesting uh, foliage out in your own yard, um, you want to be able to use them and uh, enjoy all the extra work that they, they go into uh, keeping dahlias as one of your focal flowers for fall. On the left-hand side, um, we have some foliage we, that we grow. We have some eucalyptus in there. Um, we have some amaranth, um, which is a fall foliage, a filler flower. Um, there is mahogany uh, splendor hibiscus. It's one of the burgundy foliage. There's jewels of opar. Um, it's one of the uh, airier, fillier uh, flowers. There's some zinnias in there. And then there's different shades of dahlias. Um, so you definitely want to enjoy it. You're, you're able to go out, even if you're using some of your boxwood or some of your nine bark, um, anything that you have that you want to highlight, you definitely can mix and match and add in there. Um, Lysianthus are still in bloom um, around here locally. You can add some Lysianthus to your bouquet. It might even a rose or two and really highlight um, the fall colors and, and all the burgundies and, and dark uh, colors that you have. 
We also want to think about our tubers, right? So we really want to remember that we want good quality tubers. Uh, we're wanting them because we want healthy plants. So we're wanting to manage um, when we harvest, we put into um, different crates. We want to keep colors together. If you're harvesting all at one time, you're wanting them to cure, right? So we're wanting to make sure that we're having things labeled and put places. <clears throat> we're also wanting to think about rain events. Um, in the first year, I wanted to put them up on pallets, have them into totes that I knew what the colors were, and that we, if it would rain, that they'd be covered and, and taken care of, um, because we wanted to have those healthy plants going into the next year. And you can see, um, you know, we're using that into beautiful bouquets. Uh, definitely dahlias are a showstopper um, in any of your fall or uh, late summer bouquets. Um, even for your house or, or, or for arrangement work like what we do, we want to make sure that we have those plants that we can use year after year. So some of the information that um, if you want some resources or, or some more information about dahlias and you're having some issues, um, you can check out some of these websites. So the American Dahlia Society, um, they have information and they have resources. Um, you have the dirt on dahlias. There's a, a, a Penn State a University, a University of Kentucky does some, um, Oregon State University. Dahlias have been around for a really long time, right, since the 1800s. Um, so the work that's there and the research that's continued to be done um, can be found throughout and in, in different trials that are being done every year. Um, this is another bouquet that we use. You can use your hydrangeas. There's so many different ways. So you can be creative and, and just enjoy dahlias in many, many different ways. We want to kind of let you also know, um, you can view any of our past recordings for the four seasons on the gardening series on YouTube. Uh, this is our YouTube link. You can go to goillinois.edu, four seasons recordings. Uh, there's lots of different topics. I know there recently was on fall colors and on your lawn weeds and, and care. So definitely check out those and go back to it. And then if you could take a few minutes and um, go to this QR code and let me know um, either on the website or scanning this code and let us know if you had questions, what you learned about today's topic on dahlias and if you, uh, could answer anything of their next uh, topics that you would like to learn more about. We definitely want you to give us some feedback and some information on those. And I'll give you here, this is my contact information and then I'll go back to the questions.